Elegy by Charles Leroy Nutt, writing as Charles Beaumont. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. It was an impossible situation, an asteroid in space where no asteroid should have been, with a city that could only have existed back on Earth. Elegy by Charles Beaumont. Would you mind repeating that? I said, sir, that Mr. Friden says, sir, that he sees a city. A city? Yes, sir. Mr. Weber rubbed the back of his hand along his cheek. You realize, of course, that that is impossible. Yes, sir. Send Mr. Friden in to see me at once. The young man saluted and rushed out of the room. He returned with a somewhat older man who wore spectacles and frowned. "'Now, then,' said Captain Weber, "'what's all this Lieutenant Peterson tells me about a city? "'Are you enjoying a private little joke, Friden?' Friden shook his head emphatically. "'No, sir. "'Then perhaps you'd like to explain. "'Well, sir, you see, I was getting bored, "'and just for something to do I thought I'd look through the screen.' Not that I dreamed of seeing anything. The instruments weren't adjusted either, and there was something funny, something I couldn't exactly make out. Go on, said Captain Weber patiently. So I fixed up the instruments and took another look, and there it was, sir, plain as could be. There what was? A city, sir. Oh, I couldn't tell much about it, but there were houses, all right, a lot of them. Houses, you say? Yes, sir, on an asteroid. Captain Weber looked for a long moment at Mr. Friden, and began to pace nervously. I take it you know what this might mean. Yes, sir, I do. That's why I wanted Lieutenant Peterson to tell you about it. I believe, Friden, that before we do any more talking, I'll see this city for myself. Captain Weber, Lieutenant Peterson, and Mr. Friden walked from the room down a long corridor, and into a smaller room. Captain Weber put his eye on a circular glass and tapped his foot. He stepped back and rubbed his cheek again. Well, you were right. That is a city, or else we've all gone crazy. Do you think that we have? I don't know, sir. It's not impossible. Lieutenant, go ask Mr. Milton if he can land us on an asteroid. Give him all the details and be back in ten minutes. Captain Weber sighed. Whatever it is, he said, it will be a relief. Although I never made a special announcement, I suppose you knew that we were lost. Oh, yes, sir. And that we ran almost entirely out of fuel several months ago. In fact, shortly after we left? We knew that. The men were silent. Sir, Mr. Milton says he can land us, but he can't promise exactly where. Tell Mr. Milton that's good enough. Captain Weber waited for the young man to leave, then looked again into the glass. What do you make of it, sir? Not much, Friden, not much. It's a city, and it's an asteroid. But how the devil they got there is beyond me. I still haven't left the idea that we're crazy, you know. Friden looked. We're positioning to land. Strange. What is it? I can make out things a bit more clearly now, sir. Those are earth houses. Mr. Weber looked. He blinked. Now, that, he said, is impossible. Look here. We've been floating about in space for... How long is it? Three months, sir. Exactly. For three months we've been bobbling aimlessly millions of miles from Earth. No hope. No hope whatever. And now we're landing in a city, just like the one we first left, or almost like it. Friden, I ask you, does that make any sense at all? No, sir. And it doesn't seem logical that there should be an asteroid where no asteroid should be. It does not. They stared at the glass by turns. Do you see that, Friden? I'm afraid so, sir. A lake. A lake and a house by it and trees. Tell me, how many of us are left? 
Bredan held up his right hand and began to unbend fingers. Yourself, sir, and myself, Lieutenant Peterson, Mr. Chitterwick, Mr. Goblin, Mr. Milton, and Great Scott out of thirty men? You know how it was, sir, that business with the Martians, and then our own difficulties? Yes, our own difficulties. Isn't it ironic somehow, Friden? We band together and fly away from war, and no sooner are we off the earth but we begin other wars. I've often felt that if Appleton hadn't been so aggressive with that gun, we would never have been kicked off Mars. And why did we have to laugh at them? Oh, I'm afraid I haven't been a very successful captain. You're in a mood, sir. Am I? I suppose I am. Look, there's a farm, an actual farm. Not really. Why, I haven't seen one for twenty years. The door flew open, and Lieutenant Peterson came in, panting. Mr. Milton checked off every instruction, sir, and we're going down now. He's sure there's enough fuel left for the break? He thinks so, sir. Lieutenant Peterson. Yes, sir. Come look into this glass, will you? The young man looked. What do you see? A lot of strange creatures, sir. Are they dangerous? Should we prepare our weapons? How old are you, Lieutenant? Nineteen, Captain Weber. You have just seen a herd of cows, for the most part. Captain Weber squinted and twirled the knobs. Holsteins. Holsteins, sir? You may go. Oh, you might tell the others to prepare for a crash landing. Straps and all that. The young man smiled faintly and left. I'm a little frightened, Friden. I think I'll go to my cabin. Take charge and have them wait for my orders. Captain Weber saluted tiredly and walked back down the long corridor. He paused as the machine suddenly roared more life, rubbing his cheek, and went into the small room. Cows, said Captain Weber, bracing himself. The fiery leg fell into the cool air, heating it, causing it to smoke, and burnt into the green grass and licked a craterous hole. There were fire flags and fire sparks, hisses and explosions, and the weary groaning sound of a great beast suddenly roused from sleep. The rocket landed. It grumbled and muttered for a while on its finny tripod, then was silent. Soon the heat vanished also. Are you all right, sir? Yes, and the rest? All but Mr. Chitterwick. He broke his glasses and said he can't see. Captain Weber swung himself erect and tested his limbs. Well then, Lieutenant, has the atmosphere been checked? The air is pure and fit to breathe, sir. Instruct the others to drop the ladder. Yes, sir. A door on the side of the rocket opened, laboriously, and men climbed out. Look, said Mr. Milton, pointing. There are trees and grass. Over there, little bridges going over the water. He pointed to a row of small white houses with green gardens and stony paths. Beyond the trees was a brick lodge extended over a rivulet which foamed and bubbled. Fishing poles protruded from the lodge window. And there, to the right, a steel building thirty stories high with a pink cloud near the top, and, separated by a hedge, a brown tent with a barbecue pit before it, smoke rising in a rigid ribbon from the chimney. Mr. Chitterwick blinked and squinted his eyes. What do you see? Distant and near, houses of stone and brick and wood, painted all colors, small and large, and further, golden fields of wheat, each blown by a different breeze in a different direction. I don't believe it, said Captain Weber. It's a park, millions of miles away from where a park could possibly be. Strange but familiar, said Lieutenant Peterson, picking up a rock. Captain Weber looked in all directions. We were lost. Then we see a city where no city should be, on an asteroid not shown in any chart, and we manage to land. And now we're in the middle of a place that belongs in history records. We may be crazy. We may all be wandering around in space and dreaming. A little man with thin hair, 
who had just stepped briskly from a tree clump, said, Well, well, and the men jumped. The little man smiled. Aren't you a trifle late or early or something? Captain Weber turned, and his mouth dropped open. I hadn't been expecting you, gentlemen, to be perfectly honest, the little man clucked. Then, oh, dear, see what you've done to Mr. Belfont's park? I do hope that you haven't hurt him. No, I see that he is all right. Captain Weber followed the direction of the man's eyes and perceived an old man with red hair seated at the base of a tree, apparently reading a book. We are from Earth, said Captain Weber. Yes, yes. Let me explain. My name is Weber. These are my men. Of course, said the little man. Chitterwick came closer, blinking. Who is this that knows our language? he asked. Who? Graypool. Uh, Mr. Graypool, didn't they tell you? Are you also from Earth? Heavens, yes. But now, let us go where we can chat more comfortably. Mr. Graypool struck out down a small path, past scorched trees and underbrush. You know, Captain, right after the last consignment, something happened to my calendar. Now, I'm competent at my job, but I'm no technician. No, indeed. Besides, no doubt one of you or your men can set the doodad right, eh? Here we are. They walked onto a wooden porch and through a door with a wire screen. Lieutenant Peterson first, then Captain Weber, Mr. Friden, and then the rest of the crew. Mr. Graypool followed. You must forgive me, it's been a while. Take chairs. There, there. Now, what's the news of home, shall I say? The little man stared. Captain Weber shifted uncomfortably. He glanced about the room at the lace curtains and the needlepoint tapestries and the lavender wallpaper. Mr. Graypool, I'd like to ask some questions. Certainly, certainly. But first, this being an occasion, the little man stared at each man carefully, then shook his head. Ah, uh, do you all like wine? Good wine? He ducked through a small door. Captain Weber exhaled and rose. Now, don't start talking all at once, he whispered. Anyone have any ideas? No? Then quick, scout around. Friden, you stay here. You others, see what you can find. I'm not sure I like the look of this. The men left the room. Mr. Chitterwick made his way along a hedgerow, feeling cautiously and maintaining a delicate balance. When he came to a doorway, he stopped, squinted, and entered. The room was dark and quiet and odorous. Mr. Chitterwick groped a few steps, put out his hand, and encountered what seemed to be raw flesh. He swiftly withdrew his hand. Excuse, he said. Then, oh, as his face came against a slab of moist red meat, oh, my! Mr. Chitterwick began to tremble, and he blinked furiously, reaching out and finding flesh, cold and hard, unidentifiable. When he stepped upon the toes of a large man with a walrus mustache, he wheeled, located the sunlight, and ran from the butcher shop. The door of the temple opened with difficulty, which caused Mr. Milton to breathe unnaturally. Then, once again, he gasped row upon row of people, their fingers outstretched, lips open but immobile and silent, their bodies prostrate on the floor. And upon a strange black altar, a tiny woman with silver hair and a long thyresis in her right hand, nothing stirred but the mosaic squares in the walls. The colors danced here. Otherwise, everything was frozen, everything was solid. Even the air hung suspended, stationary. Mr. Milton left the temple. There was a table, and a woman on the table, and people all around the woman on the table. Mr. Goblin did not go a great distance from the doorway. He rubbed his eyes and stared. It was an operating room. There were all the instruments, some old, most old, and masked men and women with shining scissors and glistening saws in their hands and up above the students' aperture, filled seats, 
filled aisles. Mr. Goblin put his other hand about the doorknob. A large man stood over the recumbent figure, his lusterless eyes regarding the crimson puce incision, but he did not move. The nurses did not move, or the students. No one moved, especially the smiling middle-aged woman on the table. Mr. Goblin moved. Hello, said Lieutenant Peterson after he had searched through eight long aisles of books. Hello? He pointed his gun menacingly. There were many books, with many titles, and they all had a fine gray dust about them. Lieutenant Peterson paused to examine a bulky volume, when he happened to look above him. Who are you? he demanded. The mottled, angular man perched atop the ladder did not respond. He clutched a book, and looked at the book, and not at the lieutenant. Come down, I want to talk with you. The man on the ladder did nothing unusual. He remained precisely as he had been. Lieutenant Peterson climbed up the ladder, scowling. He reached the man and jabbed with a finger. Lieutenant Peterson looked into the eyes of the reading man and descended hastily and did not say goodbye. Mr. Graypool re-entered the living room with a tray of glasses. This is apricot wine, he announced and distributed the glasses. But where are the others? Out for a walk? Ah, well, they can drink theirs later. Incidentally, Captain, how many guests did you bring? Last time it was only twelve. Not an extraordinary shipment, either. They all preferred the ordinary things. All but Mrs. Dominguez. Dear me, she was worth the carload herself. Wanted a zoo, can you imagine? A regular zoo. But... A regular zoo, with her put in the birdhouse. Oh, they had a time getting that one up. Mr. Graypool chuckled and sipped at his drink. It's people like Mrs. Dominguez who put the... the life? into happy glades. Or do you find that disrespectful? Captain Weber shook his head and tossed down his drink. Mr. Graypool leaned back in his chair and crossed his legs. Ah, he continued, you have no idea how good this is. Once in a while it does get lonely for me here. No man is an island, or how does it go? Why, I can remember when Mr. Waldemeyer first told me of this idea. A grave responsibility, he said, a grave responsibility. Mr. Waldemeyer has a keen sense of humor, needless to say. Captain Weber looked out the window. A small child on roller skates stood still on the sidewalk. Mr. Graypool laughed. Finished your wine? Good. Explanations are in order, though first perhaps you'd care to join me in a brief turn around the premises. Fine. Friedan, you stay here and wait for the man. Captain Weber winked a number of times and frowned briefly. Then he and Mr. Graypool walked out onto the porch and down the steps. Mr. Friedan drummed his fingers upon the arm of the chair, surveyed his empty glass, and hiccuped softly. I do wish you'd landed your ship elsewhere, Captain. Mr. Belfont is quite particular, and, as you see, his park is hopelessly disfigured. We were given no choice, I'm afraid. The fuel was running out. Indeed. Well, then, that explains everything. A beautiful day, don't you find, sir? Fortunately, with the exception of Professor Carling, all the guests prefer good weather. Plenty of sunshine, they say, or crisp evenings. It helps. They walked toward the house of colored rocks. Miss Daphne Trillings, Mr. Graypool gestured. They threw it up in a day, though it's solid enough. When they passed an elderly woman on a bicycle, Captain Weber stopped walking. Mr. Graypool, we've got to have a talk. Mr. Graypool shrugged and pointed, and they went to an office building, which was crowded with motionless men, women, and children. Since I'm so mixed up myself, the captain said, maybe I'd better ask. Just who do you think we are? I would thought you to be the men from the glades, of course. I don't have the slightest idea of what you're talking about. We're from the planet Earth. They were going to have another war, the last war, they said, and we escaped in that rocket and started off for Mars. But something went wrong. 
A fellow named Appleton pulled a gun. Others just didn't like the Martians. We needn't go into it. They wouldn't have us, so Mars didn't work out. Something else went wrong then. Soon we were lost, with only a little store of fuel and supplies. Then Mr. Friden noticed this city, or whatever it is, and we had enough fuel to land, so we landed. Mr. Graypool nodded his head slowly, somehow sadder than before. I see. You say there was a war on Earth? They were going to set off X-Bomb. When they do, everything will go to pieces. Or everything has already. What dreadful news! May I inquire, Captain, when you have learned where you are, what do you intend to do? Why, live here, of course. No, no, try to understand. You could not conceivably fit in here with us. Captain Weber glanced at the motionless people. Why not? Then he shouted. What is this place? Where am I? Graypool smiled. Captain, you're in a cemetery. Good work, Peterson. Thanks, sir. When we all got back and Friden didn't know where you'd gone, well, we got worried. Then we heard you shouting. Hold his arms. There. You heard this, Friden? Mr. Friden was trembling slightly. He brushed past the man with the Van Dyke beard and sat down on a leather stool. Yes, sir, I did. That is, I think I did. What shall we do with him? I don't know yet. Take him away. Lieutenant, for now I want to think a bit. We'll talk to Mr. Graypool later on. Lieutenant Peterson pulled the smiling little man out into the street and pointed a gun at him. Mr. Chitterwick blinked into the face of a small child. Man's insane, I guess, said Mr. Milton, pacing. Yes, but what about all this? Mr. Goblin looked horrified at the stationary people. I think I can tell you, Mr. Friedan said. Take a look, Captain. The men crowded around a pamphlet which Mr. Friedan had placed on the stool. Toward the top of the pamphlet, and in the center of the first page, was a photograph, untinted and solemn. It depicted a white cherub delicately poised on a granite slab. Beneath the photographs were the words, Happy Glades. Captain Weber turned the pages and mumbled, glancing over his shoulder every once in a while. What is it, sir? asked Mr. Chitterwick of the frozen man in the blue suit with the copper buttons. It's one of those old-level cemeteries, cried Mr. Milton. I remember seeing pictures like it, sir. Captain Weber read aloud from the pamphlet. For fifty years, he began, an outstanding cultural and spiritual asset to this community, Happy Glades is proud to announce yet another innovation in its program of post-benefits. Now you can enjoy the afterlife in surroundings which suggest the here and now. Never before in history has scientific advancement allowed such a plan. Captain Weber turned the page. For those who prefer that their late departed have real, permanent, eternal happiness, for those who are dismayed by the fragility of all things mortal, we of Happy Glades are proud to offer 1. The permanent duplication of physical conditions identical to those enjoyed by the departed on Earth. Park, playground, lodge, office building, hotel, or house, etc. may be secured at varying prices. All workmanship and materials specifically attuned to the conditions on asteroid K-7 and guaranteed for permanence. 2. Permanent conditioning of late beloved so that, in the midst of the surroundings he favored, a genuine eternity may be assured. 3. Full details on Happy Glade's newest property, asteroid K-7, may be found on page 4. The captain tossed the pamphlet on the floor and lit a cigarette. Did anyone happen to notice the date? Mr. Milton said, It doesn't make any sense. There haven't been cemeteries for ages. And even if this were true, why would anyone want to go all the way through space to a little asteroid? They might just as well have built these things on Earth. Who would want all this when they're dead anyway? You mean all these people are dead? For a few moments, there was complete and utter silence in the lobby of the building. 
"'Are those things true that we read in your booklet?' asked Captain Weber, after Lieutenant Peterson had brought in the prisoner. "'Every word,' said the little man, bowing slightly, "'is monumentally correct. "'Then we want you to begin explaining.' Mr. Graypool tushed and proceeded to straighten the coat of a middle-aged man with a cigar. Mr. Goblin shuddered. "'No, no,' laughed Mr. Graypool. "'These are only imitations.' Mr. Conklin upstairs was head of a large firm, absolutely in love with his work, you know, that kind of thing. So we had to duplicate not only the office, but the building, and even replicas of all the people in the building. Mr. Conklin himself is in an easy chair on the twentieth story. And? Well, gentlemen, as you know, Happy Glades is an outstanding mortuary on Earth. And to put it briefly, with the constant exploration of planets and moons and what not, our Mr. Waldemeyer hit upon this scheme, seeking to extend the ideal hereafter to our guests. We bought out this little asteroid. With a vast volume and tremendous turnover, as it were, we got our staff of scientists together, and they offered this plan, to duplicate the exact surroundings which the guest most enjoyed in life, assuring him privacy, permanence, a very big point, as you can see, and all the small things not possible on earth. Why here? Why cart off a million miles or more when the same thing could have been done on earth? My communication system went bad, I fear, so I haven't heard from the offices in a while. But am I to understand there is a war beginning? That is the idea, Captain. One could never really be sure of oneself down there what with all the new bombs and things being discovered. Hmm, said Captain Weber. Then, too, Mr. Waldemeyer worried about those new societies, with their dreadful ideas about cremation. You can see what that sort of thing could do to the undertaking business. His plan caught on, however, and soon we were having to turn away guests. And where do you fit in, Mr. Graypool? The little man seemed to blush. He lowered his eyes. I was the head caretaker, you see, but I wasn't well. Gastric complaints, liver, heart palpitations, this and that. So I decided to allow them to change me. They turned all manner of machines on my body and pumped me full of fluids. And by the time I got here, why, I was almost, you might say, a machine myself. Fortunately, though, they left a good deal of gray pool. All I know is that whenever the film is punctured, I wake and become a machine, do my prescribed duties in a complex way, and the film? The covering that seals in the conditioning. Nothing can get out, nothing get in, except things like rockets. Then it's self-sealing, needless to say. But to get on, Captain, with all the technical advancements, it soon got to where there was no real work to be done here. They threw up the film and coated us with their preservative, or, as they put it, Eternifier. And, well, with the exception of my calendar and the communication system, everything's worked perfectly, including myself. No one said anything for a while. Then Captain Weber said, with great slowness, You're lying. This is all a crazy, hideous plot. The little man chuckled at the word plot. In the first place, no cemetery or form of cemetery has existed on earth for... How long, Frieden? Mr. Frieden stared at his fingers. Years and years. Exactly. There are communal furnaces now. Mr. Graypool winced. And furthermore, continued the captain, this whole concept is ridiculous. Mr. Chitterwick threw down the pamphlet and began to tremble. We should have stayed home, he remarked to a young woman who did not answer. Mr. Graypool, said Weber, I think that you know more than you're saying. You didn't seem very surprised when you learned we weren't the men you expected. You don't seem very surprised now when I tell you that your happy Glen and all the people connected with it have been dead for ages. So why the display of interest in our explanations? Why? A faint murmur. A good machine checks and double-checks, could be heard from Mr. Graypool, who otherwise said nothing. I speak for my men. We're confused, terribly confused. 
But whatever this is, we're stuck, can't you see? All we want is a place to begin again. Captain Weber paused and looked at the others, and went on in a softer tone. We're tired men, Mr. Graypool. We're poorly equipped, but we do have weapons, and if this is some hypnotic kind of trap... The little man waved his hands, offendedly. There are lakes and farms, all we need to make a new start. More than we'd hoped for, much more. What had you hoped for, Captain? Something, nothing, just escape. But I see no women. How could you begin again, as you suggest? Women? Too weak. They would not have lasted. We brought along eggs and machines, enough for our needs. Graypool clucked his tongue. Mr. Waldemeyer certainly did look ahead, he muttered. He certainly did. Will we be honest now? Will you help us? Yes, Captain, I will help you. Let us go back to your rocket, Mr. Graypool smiled. Things will be better there. Captain Weber signaled. They left the building and walked by the foot of the great white mountain. They passed a garden with little spotted trees and flowers, a brown desert of shifting sands, and a striped tent. They walked by strawberry fields and airplane hangars and coal mines, tiny yellow cottages, cramped apartments, fluted houses and Tudor homes, and homes without description. Past rock pools and a great zoo full of animals that stared out with vacant eyes, and everywhere the seasons changed gently. Crisp autumn, cottony summer, windy spring, and winters cool and white. The six men in uniform followed the little man with the thin hair. They did not speak as they walked, but looked around, staring, craning, wondering and the old, young, middle-aged, white, brown, yellow people who did not move wondered back at the men with their eyes. You see, Captain, the success of Mr. Waldmeyer's plan? Captain Weber rubbed his cheek. I don't understand, he said. But you do see, all of you, the perfection here, the quality of eternal happiness, which the circular speaks of? Yes, we see that. Here we have happiness and brotherhood. Here there have never been wars, or hatreds, or prejudices. And now, you who were many, and left earth to escape war and hatred, who were many by your own word, and are now only six, you want to begin life here? Cross breezes ruffled the man's hair. To begin, when from the moment of your departure you had wars of your own, and killed, and hurled mocking prejudice against a race of people not like you, a race who rejected and cast you out into space again, from your own account. No, gentlemen, I am truly sorry. It may be that I misjudged those of you who are left, or rather, that happy glades misjudged you. You may mean well, after all. And, of course, the location on this asteroid is so planned by the board as to be uncharted forever. But, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Graypool sighed. What does he mean by that? asked Mr. Frighten and Lieutenant Peterson. Captain Weber was gazing at a herd of cows in the distance. What do you mean you're sorry? demanded Mr. Frighten. Well, Captain Weber, cried Mr. Chitterwick blankly. Yes, yes. I feel queer. Mr. Goblin clutched his stomach. So do I. And me. Captain Weber looked back at the field, then at Mr. Graypool. His mouth twitched in sudden pain. We feel awful, Captain. I'm sorry, gentlemen. Follow me to your ship, quickly. Mr. Graypool motioned curiously with his hand and began to step quickly. They circled a small pond where a motionless boy strained toe high on an extended board, and the day once again turned to night as they hurried past the shadowed cathedral. When they were in sight of the scorched trees, Mr. Milton doubled up and screamed. Captain! Mr. Goblin struck his forehead. I told you, I told you we shouldn't have drunk that wine. Didn't I tell you? It was the wine. We all drank it. He did it. He poisoned us. Follow me, cried Mr. Graypool, making a hurried gesture and breaking into a run. Faster! They stumbled hypnotically through the park and over the Mandarin bridges to the rock. 
Tell them, Captain. Tell them to climb the ladder. Go on up, men. But we're poisoned, sir. Hurry, there's an antidote on the ship. The crew climbed into the ship. Captain, invited Mr. Graypool. Captain Weber ascended jerkily. When he reached the open lock, he turned. His eyes swept over the hills and fields and mountains, over the rivers and houses and still people. He coughed and pulled himself into the rocket. Mr. Graypool followed. You don't dislike this ship, do you? That is, the surroundings are not offensive? No, we don't dislike the ship. I'm glad of that. If only I had been allowed more latitude. But everything functions so well here. No real choice in the matter, actually. No more than the ceiling fell. And they would leave me with these human emotions. I see, of course, why the communication system doesn't work, and why my calendar is out of commission. Kind of Mr. Waldemeyer to arrange that they stop when his worst fears finally materialize. Are the men all seated? No, no, they mustn't writhe on the floor like that. Get them to their stations. No, to the stations they would most prefer, and hurry. Captain Weber ordered Chitterwick to the galley, Mr. Goblin to the engineering chair, Mr. Fryden to the navigator's room. Sir, what's going to happen? Where's the antidote? Mr. Milton to the pilot's chair. The pain will only last for a moment or so. It's an unfortunate part of the Eternifier, said Mr. Graypool. There, all in order? Good, good. Now, Captain, I see understanding in your face, and it pleases me more than I can say. Your position is so difficult, but you can see that the machine is geared to its job, which is to retain permanence on happy glades. Well, a machine is a machine. Where shall we put you? Captain Weber leaned on the arm of the little man and walked to the open lock. You do understand, asked Mr. Graypool. Captain Weber's heads nodded halfway down then stopped, his eyes frozen forever on the city. A pity. The little man with the thin hair walked around the cabins and rooms, straightening, dusting. He climbed down the ladder, shook his head, and started down the path to the wooden house. When he had washed all the empty glasses and replaced them, he sat down in a large leather chair and adjusted himself into the most comfortable position. His eyes stared in waxing contentment at the homely interior, with its lavender wallpaper, needlepoint tapestries, and tidy arrangement. He did not move. The End of Elegy by Charles Beaumont